Sustainability Series. My name is Meg, I'm the Science and Technology Librarian here at PPL, and one half of the series. I'm lucky enough to work with Jessica Burton um, from the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. We're in our third year, so mark your calendars. We do this the fourth Wednesday of every month. And I'm just going to tell you um, who's coming, uh, coming up in the lineup. Next month on March 27th, we're really excited to have Heather McCargo of Wild Seed Project. She's going to be presenting Why Going Native Matters. And it's going to cover the many reasons we should all care about our region's native flora and bring these plants back into our developed landscapes. Then in April, it's sort of a theme here, Wild Bees Super Pollinators will be presented for, um, by Deborah Perkins. She's a wildlife ecologist of First Lake Wildlife Habitat. And she's going to talk about the fascinating lives of our native bees and also how we can save them. Then in May, um, John Hagen is going to be here to present when science doesn't matter. And uh, he's from Manomet, and their approach is building relationships of trust to create change. We do take a summer recess because there are often a lot of really lovely Wednesday nights to go out into Casco Bay or ride a bike. So we encourage people to take advantage of the cleaning season. And we'll see you back here in September, which is to be determined. But we're really excited to have Cinnamon Catlin Magutko of the Abbey Museum. And she's going to be presenting Discomfort and Renewal, Decolonizing the Abbey Museum. Without further ado, Jess is going to introduce our speaker. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Meg. Uh, I'm Jess Burton with the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. We're a service center for land and water conservation organizations in Southern Maine. We work with 19 different organizations, um, and we really work on the power of together and what that means for conservation in our community um, and sustainability. Um, so one of my favorite parts of my job is the ability to work with the library. Um, as an organization committed to partnership and collaboration, um, we really believe in the theory of change that together we're stronger. And so working with the library, we're able to access um, all sorts of different interesting resources and people and topics. So, uh, so and tonight is a wonderful experience for all of us. Uh, we welcome Molly Payne Wynn, conservation scientist with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, she oversees studies that expand our understanding of migratory fish in Maine and scientifically documents the impacts that restoration work is having on these fish, other wildlife, and the ecosystem. She coordinates ecological monitoring of the Penobscot River Restoration Project, manages collection of road stream crossing data, and conducts a myriad of public outreach, education, and citizen science efforts, including organizing and garnering support of World Fish <coughs> Migration Day. Uh, Molly earned her Bachelor of Science from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry and her Master's of Science at the, at the University of Southern Maine, USA, where she studied the microchemistry of fish ear bones. So that's going to be a question. <laughs> so we're thrilled to have Molly. Hi everyone, thank you so much for venturing out into the frigid temperatures today. Um, I am sorry to say that you're not hearing this talk from Josh Reut, who is our senior scientist at the Nature Conservancy and who was originally slated to be here. Um, unfortunately, he is with his wife in post-op who fell on the ice this week and broke her leg in three places. And so they've had a wild um, week, so to speak. And um, so he sends his regrets. And um, I just have to say that he is um, really the reason behind a lot of this work. He's been a foundation at the Nature Conservancy in Maine, um, as well as countless other um, conservation organizations. Uh, here in Maine, but also around the globe, as I'll touch on later tonight in the presentation. So um, if you see Josh, send him and his wife well wishes, um, and you'll get a sneak peek of him uh, featured in a new documentary um, that's up and coming about World Fish Migration Day. So I'll give you a little teaser um, if I entertain you enough to stick through the whole presentation. So without further ado, um, 
First of all, just sort of introducing you to the Nature Conservancy. So um, the Nature Conservancy has an office in Brunswick, Maine, and the mission of the Nature Conservancy is to conserve and protect um, the land and waters in which all life depends. And in order to um, solve these really critical challenges of our environment, it's become more and more apparent that people play a really important role in that as well. And so um, another mission, I guess, so to, say, so to speak, of the Nature Conservancy is to enhance the lives of people um, around the world. So um, this series is about sustainability. So before I launch into the details about our river restoration work in Maine um, and how that's touching down around the globe, I thought I'd talk a little bit about how river restoration and connecting um, rivers in Maine really links to that theme and idea of sustainability. So as you can see the image here, we have sort of a stretch of river that's really beautiful and blue and free flowing, um, and it's very well connected. And not only is it connected longitudinally, but it's also connected laterally. So um, the river itself is connected, but it's also connected to the vegetation, the wetlands, the landscape, and the forests on either side of that. And that's really important because maintaining healthy rivers and healthy streams, much like healthy bodies and healthy people, um, allows us to um, support ecosystems that are more resistant and more resilient, um, especially in the face of a changing climate. So keep that in the back of your mind as I'm talking about all of these um, great examples um, of river restoration that's happening um, in our own backyards and around the globe. So interestingly enough, um, the Nature Conservancy, the main chapter was actually one of the first chapters of TNC. Um, and it was uh, established, um, founded in part by Rachel Carson in the 1950s. And so over the course of the past several decades, um, the Nature Conservancy has really had a core mission of conserving land. And um, not so surprisingly, deeply embedded in these land conservation projects were really important paramount bodies of water. So here are just some of examples of places that the Nature Conservancy has um, conserved since the 50s, and you can see that sort of the highlights of some of these places are the bodies of water that are embedded in them. Um, and so it wasn't until fairly recently, like within the past 20 years, that the um, sort of focus shifted, especially for TNC in Maine, in really thinking about conservation strategies that were specifically targeted to freshwater and conservation of freshwater systems. So I mentioned um, TNC in Maine, uh, it's also um, an international organization, so there are 50, um, so there are chapters in all 50 states, as well as um, countries around the globe. And the green here, um, I just sort of pulled out and highlighted some of the places internationally where we have really prominent freshwater um, focus. So places like South Africa and Gabon, Myanmar, India, and the Balkan rivers. Um, the programs there have really um, substantial focus on the conservation of rivers and freshwater systems. And so as an uh, organization, as an inter international organization as a whole, there are priorities that stand out organization-wide, but each of the state chapters and international chapters um, have slightly different priorities, as you can imagine, because our ecosystems are slightly different around the world. So all in all, the organization focuses on um, land protection and management, um, restoring rivers. So this is about connectivity, fish passage, water quality, um, looking at ocean sustainability, so um, sustainable fisheries management, climate adaptation, thinking about reducing carbon emissions, renewable energy, food and water sustainability, policy, so thinking about um, alternative funding sources, permitting and protection, and then this element of connecting people with nature. So people are inevitably really integrated with our landscapes around the globe, and so it's really important that um, we think about conservation and protection of ecosystems with humans in mind as well. So not only is it about um, sort of all of those factors and different um, parameters that I outlined in terms of conservation and protection, but it's also about um, essentially focusing on places where there's a great amount of biodiversity and the places where we have the biggest impact to sustain whole ecosystems. 
And again, just this concept of how integrated people are in this idea of conservation um, and uh, healthy ecosystems. We have really great examples of people and their um, investments in our ecosystems here in Maine. So I have a couple examples of um, commercial fishing and recreational fishing, for example. Um, and not only that, but inspiring art and creativity and general human well-being. So now I'm at the part of the talk where I'm going to tell you all about how great Maine is as a state and from an ecological perspective. Um, I hope you can relate to my excitement and bragging nature about this, but Maine is really unique, especially our rivers and our sea-run fish populations. So we have 12 native species of diadermous fish, and diadermous means that they're sea-run. So they spend part of their life cycle in the marine environment and part of their life cycle in the freshwater environment. So as you can imagine, if there are certain parts of your life stage that are dependent on accessing habitat, you really need to be able to get in between or move across those habitats in order to survive. So if we look at all of the sea-run fish species in Maine, and we look at a map of sort of where the ranges of these different species fall, you can see that it pretty much covers the entire state. Um, so all of these animals are moving themselves and nutrients back and forth between the marine system and the majority of our state. So if we look back 200, 300, even thousands of years, um, there's evidence that these migrations in the spring of fish moving between the ocean and the freshwater habitats were amazingly impressive. So um, it's often said that in the past our rivers ran silver, and silver because of the scales and the coloring of the fish. So there's really um, incredible uh, testimony to this if you look back in some of the, um, the literature from the 17th and 18th century. So I have a couple of quotes that I just pulled out, and I'll kind of let you read these and sit with them for a second. And this last one is really my favorite. 1650, it was noted that at certain times, the entire surface of the river for a foot deep was all fish. So that's pretty incredible. And you can imagine that historically, um, the people who lived in Maine for tens of thousands of years, so the indigenous communities relied on these fish for a major source of their protein, and the European settlers up into modern times really had these incredible links to the migratory fish here in Maine. Um, the ability to use these fish as an economic source as well as a food source. Um, and really our region was known around the world as um, a really important breeding ground for um, these migratory fish. So we have the example of um, river herring being used as a really um, important lobster bait. Um, and the Penobscot River salmon, which was a really iconic um, run of Atlantic salmon, which are now critically endangered. So unfortunately, um, over the past several hundred years, we've seen pretty drastic declines in the numbers, um, the sheer magnitude of these sea run fish. And so this is just an example um, of American shad and river herring commercial landings. So these are fish that were harvested commercially and then weighed. Um, and you can see the blue um, solid uh, part of the graph is river herring, and you can see from, sorry, I don't have a pointer, but about 1950, the start of the graph, all the way up until about present day, there's a pretty drastic decline in numbers. Um, and American shad really follow that trajectory as well. Um, historically, this, these fish were up and down the eastern seaboard, um, and Maine is currently one of the last remaining states um, on the East Coast that actually has a commercial fishery for river herring. So um, what's really important to note is that not only do we still have these populations, but we actually still have active commercial harvesting. And so it's a really important economic driver in some of these coastal communities. Um, as I mentioned, river herring are a really prized um, lobster bait. So we can look at this from some more um, landings data. So this is American shad. We're looking at the bottom 1887 to about the early 2000s. And you can see that um, in 1887, we're looking on the order of 8 million kilograms of American shad landed. And it's pretty close to zero down here in the 2000s. But what's really interesting is if we take a look at the um, 
the point in time prior to 1887, so I'm going to move us back in time a little bit more, and we look at this graph. So here's the point in time prior to where that graph started. You can see now that those, those um, bars have dropped significantly in magnitude. And if we look at 1814, we're looking at 50 billion kilograms of American shad. And you see that there's a space here where there's none. And interestingly enough, this period of about 1814 to 1887 is when industrialization um, happened in Maine and a lot of dams were built on rivers. Um, so it's not um, surprising that there's a link here between the time when dams and the connectivity of rivers was severed and essentially the crash of the fishery. So the takeaway from that information is that rivers really need to flow. Um, in order to have wildlife and fish access the habitats that they really need, but also it's important for rivers to act like natural rivers. So sediment moving through the rivers, creating those special habitats and beaches along the riverscape, um, moving nutrients. I talked about the marine system and the freshwater system and how the fish are really that connector between the two, moving nutrients. Um, fish, birds, and mammals also being able to move through the rivers. Um, and so if we look at general factors that impact the health of our freshwater ecosystems around the globe, these things sort of rise to the top um, as factors that really affect the ecosystem health. So things like having um, good water quality, a flow regime, so the river flowing as a natural, in a natural state is really important. Um, the ability of invasive species, or the ability of native species to essentially um, maintain levels in the presence of invasive species and of plants and animals. This concept of um, a diversity of temperatures, so um, warming and um, other thermal barriers. Having dynamic enough channels, this is sort of a complex concept, but dynamic enough channels that allow for climate adaptation. So what I mean by that is rivers that are not just channeled straight stretches of river, but they're sort of lots of different microhabitats that allow fish and other animals to adapt to changes in water quality and water temperature. <clears throat> and then this concept of blocked access, right? It's really affecting river health. And this includes large hydro dams, um, smaller dams, we have a lot of abandoned low head, dam low head dams in Maine, um, and road crossings, so culverts as well. And when we think about ways that, um, from a restoration and conservation perspective, that we can have the most impact in restoring the health of these systems, we kind of zero in on this piece about blocked access. Because if we are able to allow rivers to function more naturally, then we're, in essence, bringing back all of the other um, healthy factors that are really important. So if we look at Maine through the lens of resilience, so this is a map of the Northeast United States, um, in particular looking at the Northern Ap Appalachians. Um, and Maine, so the darker colors represent places that are more resilient, um, and the lighter colors places that are less resilient. Um, and so in this sort of climate-driven analysis, Maine comes out on top in terms of having really um, fairly well-connected landscapes that are then ultimately more resilient to things like climate changes. Um, we have the, the most forested state in the United States, which is really important for um, headwaters habitat. We have um, comparatively really great water quality when you look at our state um, across the, the United States and, and the globe as well. I mentioned that we have all 12 species of um, native migratory fish present, and they're already reproducing and maintaining in our rivers. Um, we have the, less, the, sorry, the last best place for eastern brook trout, another native fish, uh, as well as Atlantic salmon. We have relatively long connected river networks already, um, and a diverse geography and geology, multiple temperate zones, we have minimal pavement, right? Most of us know that most of Maine is either forested or agricultural. Um, and we have very few storage dams. So what I mean by that is that the natural flows of our rivers are um, pretty well maintained when you look at Maine compared to other places um, in the East Coast and around the globe. 
So we sort of knew that by thinking about all of these different factors, again, Maine sort of rising to the top in terms of um, resilience and restoration potential, and we sort of, we have the ability to really make an impact in Maine. So in 2011, um, the Nature Conservancy did more of a scientific analysis of things that we kind of already knew that had been bubbling up to the surface about um, why Maine is so great in terms of um, freshwater connectivity and restoration potential. So the study looked at 30,000 dams across the Northeast United States, and they were all ranked based on whether or not they had native migratory fish present, um, what the upstream habitat looked like for these fish along the river gradients, um, and then the number of dams per river mile. And so again, Maine scored really well at all of these things, and in particular in the Penobscot watershed on the Penobscot River. And so that was really exciting to kind of solidify the fact that yes, Maine is really important when we look across the Northeast United States, um, and it has a lot of restoration potential because we kind of already have a lot of the ingredients that make for really healthy river systems. So this image shows um, main, um, main stem dams in the United States. This is as of 2006, so more, um, more would be shown. Um, there's a certain uh, size criteria. So this isn't showing all dams, but it's the, sort of the big ones in the U.S. And you can see that they're pretty ubiquitous throughout the landscape in the United States. Um, and Maine really led the way. And the, um, the Edwards Dam in uh, Augusta, Maine, the removal of that structure was really a catalyst for um, thinking about dam removal as a means of restoring rivers and um, aquatic ecosystem function. So in 1999, the um, Edwards Dam was removed on the Kennebec, and it was the first main stem hydro um, facility, hydro dam, um, to be removed essentially in the name of restoring the river system. So really exciting, and it got people thinking about dam removal as a tool for rest restoring these systems. So I'd like to tell you a little story, um, a side tributary, if you will, to our sort of main stem um, theme about the Sebastocook River. So this is a tributary of the Kennebec River, and it's um, seen an amazing success post dam removal of that um, Edwards Dam in Augusta. So in 1999, prior to dam removal on the main stem, there were zero fish counted at Benton Falls on the Sebastocook River. And in 2018, we saw 3.35 million fish come through. Um, fish meaning river herring. And again, I mentioned how economically important river herring are for communities here in Maine. Um, we've also noticed that the um, Sebastocook River is now home to one of the largest populations of bald eagles in Maine, and I think regionally, uh, further outside of Maine, but I'm not sure exactly on that point. Um, I'm not an ornithologist, but um, also just the fact that the community at Benton Falls is really celebrating this success story. So they have now an alewife festival that happens every spring to celebrate the return of these fish. Um, and it's super exciting. I don't know if anybody has an opportunity to go to the Ilway festival or just to see Benton Falls on the Sebastocook River, especially during the spring harvest. It's really, really awesome to be able to see um, the, the fisher people out in the water and sort of loading their boats up with river herring. So it's a really impressive success story that happened relatively fast after dam removal. So I'm going to segue to the Penobscot River Restoration Project. I mentioned this a little bit when I was talking about how great Maine is. Um, and so the Penobscot River sort of rose to the top of the top in Maine um, when, we, when we were looking at um, river restoration potential. So here's an image of the Penobscot watershed in the state of Maine. It's the largest watershed in Maine. It covers about a third of the state. Um, and it's the second largest river in New England. It's second only to the Connecticut River. Um, so there's just this immense size of the watershed um, and home to all 12 um, native species of migratory fish, including three that are listed on the, under the Endangered Species Act. So um, Atlantic salmon, um, short-nosed sturgeon, and Atlantic sturgeon. And then I mentioned before sort of this idea of having 
you know, the, the majority of Maine is forested. And so the headwaters of the Penobscot River are really this amazingly intact forest habitat that makes for really, really great headwater streams that are super important for the reproductive success of a lot of these fish. Um, and then um, the, the Penobscot Indian Nation calls the Penobscot River home. So, you know, hundreds and thousands of years of cultural significance, but also um, significance in terms of the fishery and the, the ability to catch um, protein sources right directly from the river. So there's a lot of um, economic, cultural, um, and ecological ties to the Penobscot River and the Penobscot watershed um, and the health of the system. So the Penobscot River Restoration Project um, was this unprecedented collaboration between nonprofit um, conservation organizations, state and federal agencies, the Penobscot Indian Nation, and hydropower companies. And the Penobscot Project was essentially the removal of two main stem dams that were closest to the sea at VZ and Great Works in Bradley. Um, improved fish passage at several other dams on the system, including um, a nature-like fishway or a bypass designed at the Howland Dam, and I'll show you photos of that in a minute. But um, also thinking about the balance of hydropower generation in the system and um, sort of maintaining uh, the pre-project energy level um, generation, but actually when all was said and done after the project was implemented, the energy generation in the Penobscot watershed is actually slightly higher than it was pre-project. Um, and then all of this sort of in the name of restoring not only endangered Atlantic salmon, but the whole suite of migratory fish, um, and in essence, restoring an ecosystem as a whole. Um, so about 2,000 miles of historic habitat were reconnected through the efforts of this project on the ground. So the first of the, um, the, first of the on the ground um, of the Penobscot River Restoration Project was the Great Work Dam Removal in 2012. And I mentioned that Edwards Dam Removal as being a really important catalyst in this sort of idea of dam removal as a tool for river restoration. Um, and the Penobscot Project was, um, got a lot of notoriety because it was sort of this unlikely group of partners working on restoring an entire ecosystem. So it really set the stage and people were paying attention around the globe to how this project was going to play out on the ground. So here, um, the second main stem dam removed uh, in VZ in 2013. And this is an image of um, a couple months after the dam removal. There's actually a riverside park that's been um, built on the uh, shoreline in VZ. The first time that the VZ community had access to the river in over 200 years was after this project. Um, and really important cultural, culturally significant site across the river from the dam um, for the Penobscot Indian Nation as well. So just really incredible um, reconnections with communities um, and cultures in the region. And this is the um, Howland Bypass that I mentioned. So the dam spans the river across here. And um, the dam was left in place to maintain the um, head pond above it for recreational use and benefit to the community, essentially. And so this um, channel was built around the dam that um, functions much like that of the natural river system and allows fish to kind of route around the dam structure itself. Oh, and um, another riverside park um, being built as we speak. Um, to uh, allow the community to really connect with the river. So just a um, visual about the fisheries habitat and the um, connectivity that was achieved post Penobscot River Restoration Project. So this is in 2012, just as the project begins, the lowermost dams are circled here. Um, this is a photo. And then um, May 2016, this is just after the Howland Bypass is complete. You can see now all of the blue expands up into the headwaters. Nearly 2,000 miles of um, accessible habitat are achieved. So I'm just going to toggle back and forth for impact because I think it's really incredible to sort of visualize this um, on a map. So we'll take another little side tributary and um, talk about a success that was um, 
part of the Penobscot River Restoration Project on a tributary called Blackman Stream in Bradley. So this is at the um, Main Forest and Logging Museum. If anybody's ever been, I highly encourage you to go. It's an incredible place. Um, but in 2013, um, there were zero fish. And this is just after the main stem dam removals, not quite yet to the fish passage improvements. Um, and there was actually a um, sort of a nature-like fishway that was built at the, um, at the mills there in Bradley and um, was able to maintain the historical integrity of the site. Um, and also allow fish passage. So the main stem river is now opened up and all of these river herring are knocking at the door and the fish passage was put in place. And in 2014, there were 187,000 river herring counted at Blackman Stream. And just this past year, there were 540,000 fish. Um, so it's really, really incredible. And again, we see this sort of community engagement, right? People are celebrating the fact that thousands of river herring, hundreds of thousands of river herring are now in their small stream and you can stand on the riverbanks and see the fish running silver. Um, so if you haven't done it, there are tons of places in Maine now that you can see this happen. Um, talk to me afterwards, I can give you some tips, but this in particular is a really incredible place to see it firsthand. And these numbers are also being seen on the main stem river as well. So Milford Dam um, has a um, innovative fish elevator, and so it still remains on the main stem, but allows fish to move upstream. And so we're able to get fairly accurate counts of fish at this um, facility. And so if we look at river herring um, from the early 2000s up until present day, I've um, highlighted when the, the dam removals came out, um, the dams came out on the Penobscot, and we can see this pretty awesome upward climb of river herring numbers. Um, we're off the charts now, which is really exciting. Um, so close to three million, um, and we're expecting even more this spring. So it's not just about the fish numbers, right? So the Penobscot um, River Restoration Project is also really um, innovative and unprecedented in that a lot of time was spent within the scientific community prior to project implementation thinking about the metrics that we would really want to pay attention to if we're really going to gauge the success of this project from an ecosystem perspective. Um, so for the past decade, um, we've also been looking at um, not only the fish passage and fish behavior elements, but things like food web dynamics, um, the surrounding um, shorelines and wetlands along either side of the river, the water quality itself, and the physical channel geomorphology. What happens when you take a dam out of a river? Um, in the case of the Penobscot, not much, actually. And so those were sort of the core parameters that in thinking about the ecosystem. But as the project continues to unfold, we're also looking at things like the human elements. So has recreation um, expanded because of the Penobscot River Restoration Project? Um, looking at passage at the remaining hydro facilities that are still in operation. Are there ways that we can tweak um, operations or make improvements? Um, and then touching on sort of the marine connection and looking at the effects in Penobscot Bay, trickling out um, all of these hundreds and millions of fish that are now connected to the Gulf of Maine and sort of what are the impacts that we're having in that direction as well. And so it's been a really incredible example of in a very short amount of time. So I mentioned the, the Howland Bypass um, was complete in 2016. So only a couple of years after this major river restoration project we're already seeing these um, fish and wildlife spe species rebounding. Um, and so it's been a really incredible place to really view what uh, ecosystem restoration looks like. But dams are not the only problem uh, in the Penobscot. So this map shows you all of the road stream crossings in the Penobscot watershed. And I don't actually know the total number, but it's a lot. Um, and so you can imagine if you're a fish, um, say a brook trout, and you're swimming upstream, and you're having a grand old time, and you're eating, and then all of a sudden you're trying to move up to where you're going to meet your mate and spawn and reproduce, and you come across something like this. So a salmon may be able to jump through that, but um, most of the other species probably can't. And so this is a significant barrier to being able to access those really important habitats.
And so we've been thinking a lot over the past decade about um, how do we know what's out there. There's hundreds and thousands of road crossings in Maine, and I challenge you to find one on your way home tonight. I'm sure you will. Um, and so how do we start to even think about the impacts of restoring the rest of the headwaters habitat um, outside of the scope of the main stem of the river? So enter TNC's Seasonal Stream Barrier Assessment Crew, which I've had the pleasure of managing the past several years. Um, so for the past decade, we've employed a crew of four seasonal employees, and they've surveyed nearly every single road stream crossing in the state of Maine. Um, Here's our current um, barrier status map, and the green is our completed survey area. So we're at about 90% of the state of Maine, uh, over 25,000 surveys. And so um, we're looking at not only road stream crossings from a fish passage perspective, but also from a condition perspective. So looking at the road around it, the size, the dimensions of the culverts, um, and we know now, based on this data that we've collected, that 56% of these road stream crossings are, are complete barriers to fish passage year-round. Um, and it's even more than that when we look at um, different times of the year um, and what are barriers to not only fish, but wildlife as well. It's not only about the fish and wildlife. Um, we are sort of looking at these road stream crossings through the lens of fish passage. But what we're finding is that it's also really important to think about implications for humans and communities as well. So these are places where not only are the culverts improperly sized or placed for fish, but they're also having significant impacts on our communities. So um, culverts that are um, improperly designed have a higher tendency of washing out during a flood. And so by measuring all of these road stream crossings, we're able to get at this information as well, which is really important and super tangible, especially when we have a lot of situations in Maine where if one road washes out, you've just wiped out emergency service access for an entire community. So it's really important to think about it, not only from an ecological perspective of connectivity, but from a human perspective as well. So we've developed things like um, we call decision support tools or barrier prioritization tools. So we essentially take all of this data that we're collecting out in the field and we feed it into these models. And basically we can, be, we can prioritize projects or restoration, places where we want to do restoration that have not only, that would restore not only the best habitat for fish um, and wildlife, but also thinking about the identifying the road risk element as well. And then it also can guide other people. So the Nature Conservancy isn't about to go out and replace 225,000 road stream crossings in the um, state of Maine. So it allows us to work with municipalities, other conservation organizations, to really critically think about where the funding and the rubber hits the road and where that's going to have the biggest impact for not only fish, but for communities as well. And so these tools um, sort of feed into this larger um, theme that I hope you're sensing about connecting the people with the ecological and river restoration elements. So um, this past, no, two years ago, um, we worked to develop a short sort of um, film that would convey the meaning behind river restoration for communities in Maine. So I just want to play that for you really quickly. We measure distance in miles. We measure time in minutes. But how do you measure the health of a river? One way to do it is with alewives. Every year, these little fish swim up from the Gulf of Maine to spawn, becoming the base of a huge food chain. And the further they make it upstream, the more they connect with birds, other fish, animals, and people along the way. But it's a tough journey. Old dams, blocked road culverts, alewives get stuck. And that's where groups like the Nature Conservancy come in. You see, all across the state, river restoration groups are working with towns and landowners on fish-friendly passages. So alewives can get back to places they haven't been in more than 100 years. 
and local communities can celebrate their growing numbers. A decade ago, our rivers were pretty quiet. But with the help of people like you, millions of fish are now making their way back, which means our rivers are healthier than they've been in a long time. There's a once-in-a-lifetime comeback happening in Maine right now. Help us keep it going. Um, side note, I don't know if you know of the Ghost of Paul Revere, a local band. So they did the background music for this, which was really cool. It's really great to be working in Maine at a point where we're celebrating successes. And these river restoration projects, as I mentioned, have had these really short windows from completion to seeing these incredible um, populations of fish um, rebounding. So it's a really exciting time. And I also mentioned that the Nature Conservancy is an international organization. And as you can imagine, there's rivers around the globe that are facing really similar issues to what we have here in Maine. So we started to really think about how does the work and the successes that we've had and seen already here in Maine, how do we sort of build on those and translate those around the globe? So here I have an image of um, the world and the green shading on um, the continents uh, indicates the fish, um, fish species, species richness, so essentially the biodiversity of fish. And um, the dots on the map are showing you places where dams currently exist, where they're under construction, or where they're planned. Um, and so the blue is where they exist, orange is under construction, and the red is planned dams. Um, and if we look at sort of where the majority of these dots fall, they're kind of scarily in the places where there's really great biodiversity of fish. Um, and so we have to really think about um, taking the concepts from um, our example of the Penobscot River Restoration Project and the ability to think bigger than a single dam and thinking about it from a, a regional or even ecosystem perspective. Um, and thinking about the ability to sort of balance where dams are going in, where they might come out, and thinking about that from a fisheries um, and a biodiversity restoration perspective, but also thinking about it from an alternative energy source that is hydro. Um, so we can't totally discount hydro altogether, but we've been, um, the Nature Conservancy has really um, started to coin the concept hydropower by design. So it's sort of essentially the proactive, thoughtful prioritization about where dams are going in, where they can come out, and how that has minimal impacts for maintaining biodiversity, especially for fish. So um, just, I just wanted to highlight that um, there are two places in particular around the globe that people still rely incredibly heavily on rivers for, I mean, this happens all over the globe, but these two areas in particular relying on river, uh, rivers for their main source of protein. So essentially fish from the rivers is a main food source. Um, and if we look at um, the Mekong, for example, here, um, over 40 million people rely on fish from that river as their main source of protein. So again, it's that human link, right? So not only are we thinking about maintaining and restoring biodiversity, but noting the fact that, and incorporating the fact that there are still millions of people that rely on these fish for food. Um, and if we look at um, data from the Living Planet report done by the World Wildlife Foundation in 2006, there's a general decline in vertebrate species worldwide. Um, mammals are seeing, a, a, a mammals, amphibians and fish are also seeing negative declines of varying scales. Amphibians are sort of having the the most um, at 81% decline. Um, and this is from 1970 to 2012 is when it was analyzed. So looking at the trends over that time period. If we pull out migratory fish from that report or that index from the World Wildlife Feder um, Foundation, we see that over time, again, it's that 1970 to 2012, there's a pretty steady decline until we get to the end and then we're starting to get hope again. Um, and this is essentially really directly attribu attributed to river restoration. So our ability to reconnect river systems is increasing, although a general decline, um, increasing 
migratory fish. So I mentioned the Penobscot River Restoration Project as being unprecedented, and it really was. Um, and it was looked at very carefully around the globe. People were really, really paying attention to what was happening. This was a major project. Um, since the project, um, even during the project, um, we've had really um, keen interest from around the world in thinking about taking the concepts of maintaining hydropower and sort of balancing energy generation with dam removal and fisheries and ecosystem restoration. Um, we've had delegates visit from China, India, Sweden, Germany, the Netherlands. Um, they've come to Maine to stand on the banks of the Penobscot and talk with the experts and those who actually implemented the project um, and see firsthand how we did it. Um, so that's really exciting. And thinking about that, um, Josh Reut of the Nature Conservancy, who was supposed to give this talk, um, started connecting with this guy named Herman Vonnegan from the Netherlands. Um, and the two of them really shared this common vision of this is a worldwide problem or a worldwide challenge. How do we elevate and get more attention about migratory fish and really the importance of restoring free-flowing rivers but connecting people to their rivers as well? So. Um, Herman was the founder of the World Fish Migration Day, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But I just want to um, add that Herman is this super spunky, super driven, incredibly passionate person. Um, this is a photo of him meeting the King of Finland. So the King of Finland is on the left, and Herman decided to bring him a stuffed sturgeon as like a token and a way to get the King of Finland excited about World Fish Migration Day. So between he and Josh, there is a ton of passion um, and really exciting things happening about World Fish Migration Day. And again, networking river restoration practitioners and communities and thinking about how we get work done and how we celebrate the work that's being done. So, can I see a show of hands of people who have heard about World Fish Migration Day? OK, so about half. How many of you who have heard about it have attended an event for World Fish Migration Day? OK, four, five. Um, so now you know about it. Um, World Fish Migration Day is a one-day um, global celebration that's really all about creating awareness of migratory fish and, again, the importance of free-flowing rivers and connecting people to rivers. Um, so it's a, really exciting, um, it's a really exciting day, a really exciting um, celebration. And it started in 2014. So the Nature Conservancy in Maine became an international partner so um, with Herman and really brought it to um, a global level. And so we've been investing the Nature Conservancy in Maine since inception in 2014. Um, and we've, ho we've hosted events in Maine um, since then. And so they're, over, the, over the course of World Fish Migration Day, they've sort of pulled in these sort of celebrity ambassadors and scientific ambassadors. And so this is just an example. Um, Jeremy Wade of, I think it's Animal Planets, River Monsters. Um, Zeb Hogan from National Geographic is also a sponsor as well um, and an ambassador of World Fish Migration Day. Um, and so the more people we can make aware of the problems faced by fish, the more chance we have to find solutions. Um, so I don't, I don't know about you, but I think about fish a lot. But I, I can imagine that most of you probably don't think about fish before you go to bed at night. So just sort of raising the awareness of what the challenges are and how we can think about solutions. So just examples of World Fish Migration Day. Events across the globe running the gamut from scientific talks and presentations and conferences um, to engaging kids in coloring contests and snapping selfies with um, Flatfish Stanley from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we've had really, really awesome events here in Maine. So the, um, I should mention World Fish Migration Day happens every other year. So um, 2014, 2016, 2018, and 2020. Um, and hopefully many more. Um, but there have been a lot of events. So I mentioned the um, Benton Alewife Festival and the Bradley Alewife Festival that were sort of already happening in Maine. We were kind of lucky in that 
the fish are being celebrated already. And so we've worked really hard as TNC in Maine to tap people into this World Fish Migration Day because it's a global network. Um, so um, just examples of events from um, the UK, Mongolia, Bolivia, Ethiopia, and Korea. Um, people doing really creative things, um, all about raising awareness and really celebrating the rivers and the fish. Um, this is a picture of the World Fish Migration Day in Gabon. I mentioned that TNC is working in Gabon on river restoration projects. Um, and so um, these are people that um, TNC folks have worked with directly, and they um, encourage the young people um, in the region to participate in World Fish Migration Day. They've incorporated a curriculum in the school in Gabon as well. So really exciting thinking about engaging young people and children in this effort as well, and all of the things that they can learn about not only their river, but rivers around the globe. So 2018, um, there were 570 World Fish Migration Day events. Um, over 3,000 organizations, 63 countries around the globe. Um, and there's sort of a squishy like social media reach, um, but it was anticipated or predicted that it was 50 to 70 million people um, at least saw pictures of World Fish Migration Day events um, through their social media. So it's really impressive. This is built um, from the 2014, the initial year. Um, and so it's really been growing every year since. Um, and this is the action item for you tonight. Think about um, May 2020 and how you might join, this, join a celebration or even host a celebration of your own for World Fish Migration Day. And I'll hit you with that again a little bit later. So the first World Fish Migration Day was such an incredible success. Um, and um, just really started to cement this network of people who really care about migratory fish. They really care about the health of river ecosystems. Um, and they want to talk with one another and see and hear about successes that are happening around the globe. So Herman and Josh and others um, move towards the idea of not just a day, but now there's a World Fish Migration Foundation. And from that foundation, there are lots of other efforts that have been continuing and sort of building on the success of um, World Fish Migration Day as just a, um, an event, um, a, a day, um, into something more. So there are examples. There's, there was a creation of the Swimways of the World as an educational piece. I actually have copies of it as a poster um, on the table, so feel free to grab one as you leave. It's pretty cool. Um, illustrated just sort of the migratory fish around the world and different examples of what that looks like on the different continents. Um, the Sea to Source guidebook is another example. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then these sort of two other satellite projects, um, the Amber Project and Dam Removal Europe. So these are all things that stemmed from World Fish Migration Day, but sort of now fall under the objectives of the World Fish Migration Foundation. So this is the um, poster that I have available. Um, and it's just a great like conversation tool. Um, and it's really exciting to be able to hand this out to um, school groups. Teachers love this. So if you know and love a teacher, maybe take an extra one with you. Um, just a really neat interactive tool for talking about migratory fish and the swimways of the world. Um, the Sea to Source guidebook, so I have a copy here if you're super curious. There's also a free um, digital download of this. Um, and Josh Royt was one of the um, co-editors of this book. And there are just really awesome picture examples of projects around the globe. And again, it's sort of building this concept of a network of river restoration practitioners and people that are generally interested in river restoration. So I have a copy if anybody wants to take a look afterwards. Um, this book has been a really huge success. It's been translated into multiple languages. The most recent was um, a translation into Mandarin Chinese. Um, so people are really excited about this and excited that there's a sort of a one-stop shop for learning about river restoration projects around the globe. Um, and it's slated to have a, so this is the 2.0 version, and there will be other iterations as well as more and more projects um, happen. Um, so I mentioned Dam Removal Europe. So this was another project that stemmed um, from uh, the World Fish Migration Day and the World Fish Migration Foundation. 
um, dam sort of normalizing and publicizing dam removal as a tool for ecological and river restoration. Um, Europe in itself has over 30,000 obsolete dams. So I mentioned that we have a lot of um, sort of remnant and um, abandoned low head dams in Maine. There's a lot in Europe. So um, the Europeans are now thinking about it. Um, places like Finland, Sweden, France, the Netherlands, um, the United Kingdom, um, and sort of elevating again this sort of idea of dam removal as a tool. The AMBER project. Um, so the adaptive management of barriers in European rivers. And I could not, for the life of me, remember this in any talk that I've ever given, so I wrote it up here this time. Um, so that's what AMBER stands for. And essentially, they're thinking about um, collecting data at um, road stream crossings and putting it into a tool that would allow them to map it across Europe and think about prioritizing removals and restoration projects um, across the landscape. Does that sound a little bit familiar to what I've told you about what we've done here in Maine? Um, so this is sort of a direct application of the things that we've been doing in Maine as a conservation community are now being applied in Europe, which is super exciting. So Josh serves as a scientific expert um, on their panel. And so these folks have convened. There's actually, I think there's two people, two or three people from the United States that are sort of um, guiding the process for um, a whole bunch of collaborators in Europe to think about prioritizing um, removals and restoration projects in Europe. And so these are some of the examples that have come out of this AMBER project. So there's actually nine projects in Europe that are slated for either fish passage improvements, hydro enhancements, um, dam removals, and they're sort of across Europe. So it's really exciting that not only are they thinking about ways to prioritize, but they've already identified and they've started on nine projects. And just a quick example of one of these projects um, in France. So this is an existing dam structure that's a pretty severe barrier to fish passage. Um, this is actually one of, a, one of the great salmon rivers in France. So um, sort of a similar story to what we see here in Maine. Um, this is a um, engineer drawing of what the, um, or a sim simulation of what the dam would look like after fish passage improvements and hydro enhancements. So what's happening here is they're essentially reducing the head height of this dam structure, which allows for not only better fish passage, but it also allows them to totally redo the antiquated hydro um, technology that was in the dam. And so they're actually generating more, or they will be generating more hydropower at this facility, and they also have increased fish passage, um, in particular for salmon. So these are the types of things that we um, have really been able to bring uh, on an international scale from the work that we've been doing in Maine and thinking about, again, that sort of balancing hydropower with the needs of the ecosystem and how that plays out in real time. So this is happening um, as we speak in France. And so the one other thing that I just want to um, highlight about our rivers and sort of thinking about the work that we've done um, and are still doing, we still have a lot of work to do um, here in Maine, is connected across the landscape. So not only the fish and the wildlife and the health of the river and aquatic system itself, but thinking about, again, the way it connects to people, the way it connects to renewable energy, connection around the globe and sort of bringing our story, um, and then connection to the ocean environment as well. I mentioned that sort of marine, the Gulf of Maine connection um, between our freshwater habitat. And what we've really come to realize is that the only way to get this work done especially in Maine, is connecting with the people and the communities that we're, that we're doing the work in. Um, so whether it's meeting with um, people at the State House, um, to hosting family events on the Sheepscot River to celebrate the dam removal projects that are happening there, um, to engaging unlikely partners, road commissioners, um, soil and water conservation districts to be on the ground with shovels and helping us in these restoration projects. Um, to engaging the scientific community and thinking about how do we document the impacts that our ecological and river restoration projects are happening. Um, it's really, really rising to the top that it's so critical to engage people in this work. And so the moment you've all been waiting for that I mentioned in the very beginning. Um, 
So this is a trailer. Um, the World Fish Migration Foundation um, has worked with a um, documentarian. Is that a word? Documentarian? Filmmaker? Um, <laughs> to make a film about World Fish Migration Day. And um, it's being currently shown in the next two weeks um, at the DC International Film Festival. Um, it's been asked to be part of the um, Wild and Scenic Film Festival. And so this is a, I wanted to, I wanted to like try and show you the actual film, um, but I, I wasn't allowed until it hits the DC circuit for the film festival. So you'll have to make do with a teaser trailer um, and know that we're thinking about ways, um, in particular this spring, Herman Vonnegut is actually gonna visit us here in Maine. So we're thinking about trying to host um, a film showing possibly in Brunswick, because it's very convenient for us TNC folks, um, and having a panel discussion and sort of a meet and greet with Herman after that. So um, keep that in mind. But without further ado, um, a trailer for the documentary, and you will see our very own Josh Wright. World Fish Migration Day is a series of global events held on even years to bring awareness of the importance of free-flowing rivers and migratory fish around this common theme, connecting rivers, fish, and people. This year, World Fish Migration Day consisted of 552 events in 63 countries around the world. There was a global headquarters in Helsinki, Finland, and there were continental headquarters. There was one in Africa that was in Kruger Park of South Africa, in Bolivia for South America, along the Mekong River for Asia. There's another one in India and one in Australia. My job was to meet up with some of the U.S. leaders in river restoration from the U.S. Forest Service, NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. From the banks of the Potomac, I headed out into the field to join the amazing Richmond World Fish Migration Day event The lead coordinator for this event was an amazing woman, Kathy Hoverman. She's the senior stream restoration designer for KCI Engineering. Kathy has this rare mix of engineering chops and ecological passion, making her a great person to evaluate a river and find ways to make it work, both for the life in the stream and the people around it. It was in 2016 when they had the Happy Fish at the conference. Yeah. I was like, this is awesome. Oh, that's I, great. I, I, I've got to host one of these in, in my town. World Fish Migration Day brings people to rivers with an excitement for restoring them and these massive migrations of fish. When I see kids and adults like me acting just like kids, totally engaged and beaming with awe, I realize there's a lot of hope in our rivers. It's an amazing time to be living and working around rivers, a time when rivers are being brought back to life and connections are being restored between fish and wildlife around our rivers. And when people are engaging again with the very cradles of our civilization, cities and towns that were built around rivers. I love World Fish Migration Day for bringing us together, connecting rivers, fish, and people. with Herman and Zeb Hogan from National Geographic. And we played it in front of a room of 90 people, just the trailer. And I was standing there and there were tears streaming down my face. I was so excited that there was a, a visual, artistic way to articulate the meaning behind World Fish Migration Day that really everybody could relate to. Um, so if I have inspired you in any way to think about hosting or participating in a World Fish Migration Day event, um, May 16th, 2020 uh, is the date. Um, and if I further inspired you to make any sort of financial contribution, either toward the Nature Conservancy in Maine or the World Fish Migration Foundation, please come see me afterwards. But really, most importantly, um, it's about 
participating in these events. Not only um, hosting them, which is kind of a step up, but just going to one of them. So go to the Dan Riscotta Alewife Festival, go see the fish run um, in Blackman Stream in Bradley and see firsthand. We're in a really unique place on the globe that we can see the impact of conservation and restoration happening in real time. So I encourage you, in a couple of weeks, hopefully spring will get here, um, to go out and really see this for yourself. Um, and I will leave you with one of the people who is most happy about river restoration. This is my daughter, Clara, and I could not put a picture of her in her presentation. Um, and then one other, um, just a couple of upcoming events. So 2019 is actually the year of the salmon, the international year of the salmon. And so um, it is uh, just a time and a place to really think about um, Atlantic salmon restoration. So we have a lot of events going on. Um, lots of our partner um, organizations are also hosting events uh, in the name of International Year of the Salmon. There's one tomorrow, so the kickoff event in Maine for International Year of the Salmon is happening at the Maine Discovery Museum in Bangor tomorrow night. Um, so if you happen to be in Bangor tomorrow night, stop by. Um, and also uh, March 17th, as part of the Maine Science Festival, I'm, I'm hosting a panel of river restoration, fisheries restoration experts here in Maine. Josh will be there, so if you want to meet Josh, um, March 17th in Bangor at Nocturnum Draft House. Um, Beers will also be there, so mark your calendars. Um, and then just, I wanted to throw up um, a couple of the websites so that if you want more information, you can um, visit those. Uh, and with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. And I just want to say to you, I have been to many presentations. I am the most critical person in the presentation. It was my job. And you did a fantastic job. I still really have to tell you that. And, and anyway, and, and the project is great. I do have a question. The dams that came down in is the hydroelectric power that they provided. You don't get rid of that, do you, as you eliminate the dams? Correct. So those were um, hydro facilities, and the power generation was actually shifted to other dams that are already in place in the system, just by um, improving the infrastructure that was already in place. So new turbines went in, um, and um, so overall the power generation was maintained, and it's actually better than it was pre-project. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So you, you really did fantastic. Thank you. you did. Yes. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Um, you didn't mention the forest products industry and logging and their role in in all of this, because I'm assuming that there's a lot of that happening in the whole Penobscot River watershed. Yeah, so it's still there. I mean, I think the important takeaway is thinking about um, the connection with communities and the river. Um, the idea that we're not going to um, abolish hydro generation, we're not going to um, essentially change Maine's economy that was founded in forest products, um, so it's still maintained, but thinking about um, being careful in the interactions that those industries have with the ecosystem health. Does that sort of answer your question? Possibly. Is there any role that it plays in the ecosystem health? Um, definitely, I would say, you know, especially in terms of water quality, but we're also, I think, in general, seeing a shift in some of the industry. I mean, we know that we've seen, um, we're, not, we're not, for example, floating logs down the river anymore. Um, a lot of our pulp and paper mills have been closing and are sort of shifting and transitioning into new industry. Um, so I think some of the issues are sort of being remediated on their own just with an economic shift. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, this is not, maybe not in your wheelhouse, but I'm wondering if you know anything about how dam technology and the hydropower technology has changed. Has it evolved at all since early dams went in? Or is anyone thinking about how you make a dam that creates power with less impact on a river? Yeah, so I would actually go back to, let's see if I can do it quickly. The example in France okay. of that dam um, that 
uh, they're thinking about sort of implementing new age hydro technology that allows the head height of the dam to be reduced so the head pond um, behind it is acting more like a river so you have increased fish passage and also increased power generation. So there are ways to think about that from a hydro perspective but what's really important to not be afraid of is not thinking about these on a case-by-case -case basis but really um, proactive planning and thinking about how these individual hydro dams play out from a landscape perspective and how they interact with one another within a given river system. Great question, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah? And one of the early slides you showed, um, showing the decline of the river herring, um, it, it, there was kind of a spike up around 19, as it was dropping, there was a spike around 1984. And I wonder if you've had any explanation for what that spike was related to. Not that one in particular, um, but a lot of these fish species are, um, they do have cyclical life histories. So like river herring, for example, have a three to four year um, reproductive um, ma maturity. So it takes about three to four years before the next generation is really up and moving into the river. So that may have, that may have played into it um, in some cases. Um, it's interesting when we think about returns on the Penobscot River um, in particular, we are now in the first year of fish that are reproducing that have only seen a free-flowing lower Penobscot River. Um, so fish that were born just after the dam removals and are reproducing again. So it's really exciting to think about that from sort of that um, species cyclical change. Um, and I imagine that would have played into that spike in 1994, but I can't really say. Yeah. Um. Can you eat the fish in the Penobscot River there? Yes. I don't know how many can you consume, because I grew up in the river and it was like, due to the, I mean, it's like the late 80s, early 90s, it was like two a year, but my mom was like, none a year. <laughs> yeah. So that's actually a really, um, it's a really great question, and um, it's a really important issue, especially for the Penobscot Indian Nation. As you can imagine, their subsistence fishing and their um, main maintenance of their treaty rights on the Penobscot River. Um, so I know there's a um, scientist at uh, the Penobscot Indian Nation who's worked with the EPA in doing um, assessments of basically contaminants within the fish populations to get a more accurate um, number of the fish that are actually edible. And it is a really, it's a problem, right, if you're relying solely on fish from the Penobscot River as your main food source. Um, I think the numbers are still pretty low in terms of what is a um, consumable number per year. Um, and that's something that um, played a really important role in um, the Penobscot Nation as a really key partner in the Penobscot River Restoration Project, this idea of restoring not only the numbers of fish, but the water quality and sort of the general ecosystem health of the river because it has such important um, food and um, cultural meaning to them. So, great question. Yeah. Um, what's the data collection process like for counting fish? Like, are you tracking individual fish or is it you gather them and you're counting as you go through? Yeah, so there's numerous ways that we can count them. Um, the most Simplistic is um, places like the Milford Dam that I mentioned. So on the main stem Penobscot, there's actually a, um, a fish elevator. So the fish swim in and they're lifted up over the dam. And in that process, they're actually, they're swimming through a viewing window. And so we can video and count them that way. In some of the smaller um, tributaries, there's actually um, tubes set up in the river so that individual fish have to swim through the tubes and they're counted as they swim through. Um, and then in other places, people are on rotating volunteer schedules with clickers. And so they're looking at a particular space in the river and they're counting the number of alewife that go through. So there's kind of a range of um, our uh, technologies for counting the fish. Um, the fish, uh, the salmon and sturgeon and American shad, we do have active tagging programs in collaboration with the University of Maine. So we are able to put actual tagging devices on those fish and count them um, that way. It, but it, that one's more about sort of where they're actually moving and not necessarily the numbers of fish. Um, and so the numbers that you see are from the Department of Marine Resources, and those really are a conservative best guess 
Um, we know that there are a lot more fish in the system, but this is our best guess and sort of maintaining that conservative um, estimate of what the numbers are. Yes? In developing countries, does the World Bank have a role either positive or negative? Are they encouraging hydroelectric dams or are they recognizing that? <coughs> Yeah, um, that's a really great question. Um, that's unfortunately out of my area of expertise. Um, yeah, great question. I'm not sure. How has flooding in the communities where the dams have been removed, how has that changed in those types of cycles? So what's interesting is that um, I mentioned that a lot of the natural flow regime is actually pretty intact in Maine. We have very few dams that are actually storage dams, where they're storing a large amount of water above the dam and sort of having time releases of when that flow moves through. Um, the main stem dams, like on the Penobscot, for example, are called run of the river dams, in that they're um, allowing essentially the natural flow in terms of the amount of water moved through the system to be maintained. So there aren't really um, drastic implications, like on the Penobscot River when we took out the dams, it didn't um, necessarily change the flow regime that much because they're, they weren't storage dams to begin with. Um, so we don't see a lot of um, flooding that we might expect in other places, especially out west when they have, they have a lot of um, storage behind the dams and so they have to think about um, how that impacts the system when the dams are removed. How would you describe the challenge posed by a community that takes pride in their dam? It's um, not an uncommon challenge, especially in Maine. Um, I would use the <coughs> Howland Fish Bypass um, as an example. So um, that particular um, uh, upstream impoundment that was created by the Howland Dam in place is sort of the center of town in Howland. So I don't know if you've ever been there, but the houses are surrounding that. It functions as essentially a lake on the river. And so people are boating, they're fishing, and they're really tied to the fact that this um, head pond or the headwater of the dam has been there for hundreds of years, right? Um, so people um, in general, I think, especially in Maine, are, are fairly resistant to change, right? It's sort of this like, fear of the unknown, well if you take the dam out, what the heck is my river going to look like, right? Um, and so in the case of the Howland Bypass, it was really about um, thinking creatively about a compromise. So the um, dam was actually, it's maintained in the river, it still keeps the integrity of that, um, the impoundment above, um, but the fish bypass is routed around the dam and that functions very much like a natural river system, a natural channel. It's not necessarily a solution in all cases to sort of um, route around the dam, um, but um, in places where there is a lot of challenge and a lot of resistance to change, I think um, thinking really creatively about what a compromising, uh, what a compromise would look like is really important. Um, so with both the large projects and the smaller dam removals. Who usually pays for those, especially when it's just for returning the sea runnability for the fish? Yeah, so um, I, we could probably write a book on the varying funding sources available for anything ranging from a culvert to a full dam removal and full project implementation like the Penobscot. In the case of the Penobscot, um, it was a mix. And in the end, it was about 50-50 public and private um, funding. So um, there was a lot of support from federal agencies like NOAA in terms of that project and the implementation, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, but then we had really significant private donations from people who, have, um, who live in or grew up in Maine and were really excited about thinking about restoring a river system. Um, and I mentioned early in, the, um, early in the presentation the idea of TNC sort of thinking about policy from a permitting, protection, and funding perspective. Um, and so uh, we think about things like the water bond and the ability to use that as a funding source for communities 
when they're looking at replacing road culverts um, and thinking about doing that in a way that's benefiting not only the community but um, the fish as well. So it, it really kind of runs the gamut um, in terms of um, pub public and private um, and also we do you know grants as well. We apply or help municipalities apply through grant programs as well. Thank you. <coughs> yes. Yeah, our, our local river here in Portland is the Perzumpscot. I know that uh, the Sacrapa Dam will be removed soon in Westbrook. Um, but I was just wondering if there's any other dams that are coming up soon that are kind of in the bullseye for major fish passage or removal um, of Knopscott or Kennebec or anyone else. Yeah, so um, on the sheep, Scott, we actually have an expert in the room. Sorry, Miranda, I have to do it. Um, the Sheep Scott River in Mid Coast Maine um, is actually under a, a restoration project is underway, thinking about multiple dams and sort of dam removal and fish passage improvements there. Um, so that's really um, very exciting and fairly close to home. Um, I can't think of any other um, dam removals off the top of my head, but we've been doing a lot of work thinking about how to build on the momentum created in the Penobscot watershed and thinking about road stream crossings in particular. Um, so we have really tended to focus our efforts in the past couple <coughs> years on um, continuing the connectivity in that watershed and looking at not just dams, but road crossings as well. Um, so that's a really great question, and I would encourage you to um, check out nature.org slash Maine um, or check out our Facebook page because we update our social media and we love to let people know when projects are coming up and things that are exciting to know. I'll just mention too that uh, I'm uh, involved with the Friends of the Perdump Scott River mm -hmm. and we do have events that are part of the uh, World Migra Fish Migration Day, so awesome. people can um, go to perdumpscottriver.org and check that out. Nice, thank you. One more, Miranda. Um, I'm curious of what out of all twelve sea runs that you have favorites, and maybe I'm not sure why. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like picking my favorite kid. Um, so uh, I did my master's research on blueback herring. Um, so river herring, or alewife and blueback herring collectively, are known as river herring. Um, and blueback herring are kind of like the step kid because most people in Maine know what alewife is or are, and most people haven't necessarily heard of a blueback herring. So bluebacks are my favorite, um, and they are slightly different from alewives, even though they're lumped into the same general river herring category. They have slightly different life histories, and I think that makes them really cool. And they're super hard to tell apart. So if you have an alewife and a blueback herring, visually, it's almost impossible to tell them apart. So yeah, they fly under the radar, and I like that. <laughs> Great question. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Molly. Thank you.